text me, call me when you can. So I think during your discussion time, I'll call you. Um, thanks, Father. Right on. Super cool to be with you guys, and especially, it's so delightful for me is uh, being able to come week after week is a total, uh, like a exhale for me, uh, because a couple things. One is, we get to know each other just better and better, more and more as the weeks go by. And for anything I'm trying to teach, you sort of have to know your audience, and so that that's happening, which is great. The other is, doesn't matter how fast I try to talk, I never fit it all in. <laughs> and so, um, so knowing I can kind of, you know, it can kind of spill over the next week, and also a little review. I like I like doing that. So, so we will do a bit of that. Uh, officially tonight, we will start our second segment in this Life from the Heart series. And I'm glad Father mentioned that during Vespers too. Just that reinforcement of Life from the Heart. That if you don't remember anything else, it's like, oh yeah, what am I what am I working on? Life from the Heart. Uh, how's it going? Oh man. Uh, uh, let me see, have I been in my heart lately? Like, so it really gives us a good reference point. Uh, whether we're talking about our relationships, uh, whether we're talking about our spiritual journey, whether we're talking about even satisfaction with our jobs, if we're talking about, like, I don't, I don't not connect with my kids anymore. Same topic, light from the heart. So I, I really like that. I like the way we're reinforcing that, and rightly so. Um, this second segment... We go from the first segment, which was uh, getting love right, and then now we're going to officially start uh, boundaries and insights into our family dynamics. Again, we have the luxury of having four weeks together on this topic. So tonight, I want to make sure we build the foundation uh, and really almost almost like super foundational, super introductory, but vital to understand it with a, with a, a decent amount of discussion. And then next, the next two weeks, uh, for those of you who are coming here for free, free therapy, uh, you definitely will be getting your money's worth the next two weeks for sure, or your free therapy back, however that one works. But uh, no, so this connection to boundaries and family means uh, we're going to get up close and personal from the standpoint of how do I understand boundaries? Well, how do I understand my family? So we're going we're gonna to touch on that tonight. However, before we get to that, I want to uh, get at um, a little bit of review. Remember last week we talked about, which I again love these two words going together, love, praise. And Father, after the presentation last week, texted me this quote, and so I thought I'd just put it in, a, in the PowerPoint tonight as a great way to sort of put a bow on last week and also just that we could... Remember that we're still trying to uh, intersect that whatever we love then it turns into prayer. So here, El Devalia says, a heart that is full of love thinks not in itself, but of others. It prays for all living things and for the whole world. So when our love grows, our prayer grows. When love is real, then it will love more and more and pray more and more. And it's powerful to so you are praying for the whole world or praying for every single encounter you have uh, throughout a day. Uh, right on. So uh, again, in way of just wrapping up last week, I did want to just touch on that. It's kind of that kind of Game of Thrones kind of picture there. But we're being reminded um, that our thought life and this is where we're going to get into family a bit tonight. That we can think about a child gets plopped into a family, and their life is, you know, young life is kind of supposed to be like a playground. It feels safe, it's playful, um, it's not traumatic, and yet things happen in life, the unexpected. And so not only does life sometimes go from a playground to a battleground, but certainly what our thought life encounters goes from a thought life, goes from a battleground, uh, goes from a playground to a battleground. And I just want to kind of ask that question, or just put it out there. We won't have time to discuss it. I just want to keep 
almost like bringing us along in this idea of being really aware that wherever our thoughts go, that's where our life's going to go. And if our thoughts go uh, uh, dealing with reality, then our life will be rooted in reality. So, um, when we think about the battleground, we think about like a landmine, what comes to mind if our thoughts is where the battle takes place? And we even said, last week we talked about even spiritual battles look to attack our thought life. Right? And so, the idea even of children growing up in families, when we think about self-esteem, we kind of put that in a category, like how's my kid's self-esteem? Very often, just the status of a person's self-esteem is just really the outgrowth of what's going on in their thought life, except their thoughts about themselves. So we have a whole generation right now of kids who are being sort of tortured within because their thought lives are being attacked all the time, and they're basically concluding, as I mentioned before, by the time they're 10 or 11, they've pretty much gotten pretty attached to, I'm not good enough. Now, I don't just assign that to our kids or this young generation. I'm saying we all have these battles around how we think. And the enemy wants to twist us like a pretzel on how we think about ourselves, because the more negative that is, the more negative our relationships are going to be. And then in turn, tonight, we're going to say, then our boundaries will be all over the place, and it will be a mess. So... Just this idea of like what blows us up. What, what are landmines? One thought I would just want to pass along as we move through the review is that wherever we might have unresolved pain, it's going to be a landmine. It's just that our unresolved pain could be within us about something or about ourselves or about someone that we've encountered or some relationship we've had and we hold on to that pain, that'll be a landmine because our thought line then is going to be torn up in battle with things like resentment and uh, things like uh, being stuck on the battlefield, being stuck where we got shot, wherever that hurt thing happened. So one kind of landmine would be what kind of pain do I hold on the inside? And the other kind of landmine is what kind of pain is going on in my relationships? What kind of pain here is unresolved? And what kind of pain in my relationships? There might be one, two, or more that are relationships that are totally hurting, that are unresolved. Those are the landmines that we're going to step on that create more and more battle that really cause our thought life to be sort of held hostage. Okay? Move on. So I wanted to mention, and I don't know if you recognize that graphic there and the Matthew passage, but there's a great Greek word, nexus, where um, you've, you've heard this as a gospel reading, where Jesus is getting ready to go to the Garden of Gethsemane to have like the big prayer before they arrest him and before crucifixion. This is during the Passion Week, during the Holy Week. And Jesus knows there's a lot coming, and he really tells his guys, I... He says, uh, stay over here and pray, and I'm going to go over there to the garden and pray. He does it a couple times, and when he comes back, that's what he finds. They're snoozing like crazy. And in the gospel, in Greek, he, Jesus uses the word nepsis, which is translated in English, watch and pray. It's where we get the root word for vigilance, or being watchful, or being awake. Now, I put the word, the letters there, D-U-I. Now, I'm not going to ask, uh, you know, if you've had close calls on that. I mean, some of us are from a generation where drinking and driving kind of went together like, you know, uh, whatever. <laughs> sort of was part of an evening. <clears throat> Peanut butter and jelly, right? But why do I put D-U-I? Because the idea of a D-U-I is what? Driving. Under the influence. And so I want us just to think about that just for a second on this very cool, uh, as we wrap up this portion around prayer, that it has a lot to do with this nepsis, this watchfulness, being awake, being sober. So it's where we get the word sober. A lot of people think the word sober is to stop drinking. Sober is a word that talks about how clear our thinking is. 
Right? We have so we're sober minded. We're sober thinking. Yeah. Well, when you're talking here, the other thing that comes up is also TMI. Too much information. Too much information. Okay. Too much information. We're blocking your cognitive ability to think. To think clearly. So so definitely, even just whole uh, TMI or we give a distraction can goof up our thinking. And so the idea is. This idea of sobriety is clear thinking. If we have clear thinking, we can navigate. Just like we have enough sense nowadays that we don't drink and drive, because the thought of navigating under the influence of something that impairs our sobriety, our clear thinking, leads to disaster. I want us just to think for a moment to say, this driving, this navigating is how you do life. So we're out of the car for a second. This idea of driving is how you do life, how I do life, and how sober-minded are we in doing life, or how under the influence are we of our own pain, or our own anger, or our own, uh, even not even paying attention to what other people think. So now we're going to talk about boundaries. We sometimes find out the hard way that we've crossed a boundary because we navigate under the influence of sometimes our own ego. Sometimes we navigate under the influence of not even knowing we're supposed to care about what I do and how that affects someone else. So I just want us to, to think for a moment, we're talking about prayer. One of the things it does is it helps us drive in a sober way. It helps us navigate in life, life in a sober way. With not enough prayer, we may just go like these guys. Oh, okay, Jesus, I'm totally, St. Basil is the place I'll meet you there. But, like, how I do life, I don't know, we'll just see how it goes. This sort of sleepy approach to life is the opposite of the prayerful, watchful life. And it's more watchful that we love uh, uh, effectively. And so, um, so I, I just want us to think about that. How do you navigate? How sober are you? And what do you do in life that helps you be sober? Right? Okay, next slide. Okay, so um, I wanted just to read this uh, super quick. Um, um, how many did the prayer last week? Remember that little imagery we talked about last week? Uh, anybody do that? What did you guys think? What was that like? Helpful. Helpful. Good. Good. So you kind of filled the tanks before launching. Uh, so, so we, you know, we talked about last week. Well, there was a wording in there that says our first work. If you remember from last week's handout, our first. In fact, I think it's. Uh, did I put it on the? Uh, in fact, tonight's handout. Look on the back. On the, the, the portion on the bottom. Yeah, so from last week, in red, on the bottom portion, it says, your first work should be to shut yourself in your own heart as if taking position in an arena. I like that idea. And so the day possibly goes better. It's hard to do. We have to break scar tissue to do it. We have things that are calling for us every which way. And yet we're going to take some minutes to do our first work. Yeah, your peeps, right? Yeah, right? Your first work. So, right now, if we're saying Christ is calling us towards self-examination, very similar to the first work, is what's in red up there, is our daily task. This actually is um, from a fantastic book that I think I referenced there, maybe a future series we do here, uh, The Beginnings of a Life of Prayer. But let me just read that. Our daily task is great. To look inward to the depth of the heart. To discover there the chains that bind us deep to the bottommost parts of the sea. And by the grace of Christ, to struggle against them. We are called to work through the redemptive power of the incarnate Lord to defeat that which seeks our destruction. We are to take stock of our condition daily. See, this is our first work. This is our daily task. To take stock of our condition daily to see uh, it in its true weakness and call upon the solace and support of the charitable Lord to overcome it. 
We are called to change, to be transformed, to see and know ourselves so that, why do we want to see and know ourselves? So that we can offer ourselves to Christ for transfiguration. The more we see what's up in here, the more we know what to surrender in here. Okay? Uh, next slide. Okay, so just to wrap up this portion, how many have had a house lesson? Anybody? Don't you do that right around, right around now, right? House lesson is a great idea. You call a certain person for that house lesson, right? Yeah. So, Father Pete's probably been busy. Uh, doing amazing work to bless your house and cleanse it in a way. I, I, I mentioned the house blessing because that, that's how I want us to understand the rule of prayer. Ultimately, that's the, that's the same conversation you're going to have with Father Pete so that whatever your rule of the church teaches, that all of us are meant to have a rule of prayer. So if you work out at the health club and you went through some kind of, you have a personal trainer, they don't, they don't say, hey, welcome to the club. Well, what are you feeling? Like? <laughs> uh, oh, aren't you, want, you want some guns? You want some big arms? Uh, cool, we're going to, you know, yeah, that, that, the, the, the belly that you, you inherited from those six packs of beer every week, uh, we, we don't, ah, who's going to notice that? Let's get the beach muscles going. You don't go to a health club and just willy-nilly it if you want to get strong and be an athlete. The rule of prayer is the same way. It's not meant to be you wake up in the morning going, oh, let's see what I might pray, if I pray, when I pray, and whatever comes to mind. So we, we understand that about our faith. And we can talk to Father Pete just to sort of line up and maybe solidify the same way you have a house blessing, and that is like, man, I want to make sure I'm sort of, you know, Lean. I want to make sure I'm strong at the core when it comes to my prayer life. So I'm just mentioning here a passage from Hebrews that's also from the Old Testament in Jeremiah. And I like this. And I want to make this point and I'm going to launch into some boundaries. The scriptures say, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. So check that out. Just from a, I mean, that sounds pretty scriptural. Think about that psychologically. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I think if we're going to put a bow on getting love right and if we're going to put a bow on that love phrase, it would be that we'd be recognizing my mind doesn't have a chance if it's trying to navigate, maybe not even sober, in life with, with, no, with no kind of house blessing. Have you blessed this house? Well, if you're gonna, if you're gonna clean house, you gotta go mind and heart. I kinda like that. And what do I do every day so that not only will the Lord's ways, his laws, his ways of thinking, get in my mind and be written on my heart. But it's not just like, so my life can improve. No, because there's an intimate call that I will, that he says, I will be their God and they will be my people. So I want us to keep in mind, the intimate connection with God, very personal for each of us, is where we then say, hey Lord, can you do a house blessing again today? Uh, make sure you get the closets too. Make sure you get the file cabinets, too. Make sure you get to those places. I've talked to a lot of addicts, and the, the, the worst time an addict has is their last stash. Mm -hmm. That last little bit that's tucked away, that's when they go sideways, man. You can take a lot of things, yeah, I'm good with that, I'm good with that, but boy, oh boy, they grab onto that last stash. Because then they're gonna have to trust life without it. I heard one, one monk say, you know, we are pretty good at following the will of God. Oh, except for sex and money. So even that would be like, hey, we do pretty good. But there can be a couple areas of life where we go, ur, ur, my will, not yours. Okay? So, all right. And just to show 
you, my rule of prayer includes this verse, personally, since I was 25. And I don't say that because I'm some spiritual guy that glamorous, well, I've been doing this for a zillion years. I remember being 25, I couldn't make sense of life, and somehow I stumbled across this, and I've prayed it every day, and I'm, I'm happy to say, and, I, um, and you know, I have a couple kids, I got one off to college, I shared this one with her over Christmas break, and this is part of her rule of prayer now, and it couldn't make me happier, because for her, it reaches her heart. Because she has a bit of anxiety sometimes, and this jumped off the page for her. What's it say? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So this is an example of, can I meditate even on this for 10 seconds in the morning? Maybe that's going to help me navigate in a more sober way. Whatever your rule of prayer needs to be, you're going to talk to each other, you talk to your loved ones, you talk to your priest, and then we, we really start making sense of the path. Okay, moving on. All right. Bum, ba -dum, bum. Here we are, officially going into segment two on boundaries. Okay? Um, and we see kind of drawing the line. So I, I, I don't mind us thinking about boundaries as kind of drawing lines. Let's take a peek for a second, though, on the next slide. I want us to look at two basic, and this is where you take a few notes, two basic definitions on boundaries. And they're super basic, and I like them super basic. One would be, the first one would be the idea of a property line. The idea of a boundary would be, this is where I end and you begin. A basic boundary, I'm this person, you're that person. Now, I came across an article in the, I grew up in San Francisco, and so reading the Chronicle was something I always did growing up, and the, and the uh, you know, sports page, and Sunday, you have a big old paper that comes, and all that. And I remember reading in the Chronicle years ago about, and it was way up in Northern California, something like Susanville, or some town I had never been to before, and it talked about these two neighbors. And what caught my attention, it wasn't a long article, but it caught my attention because these two neighbors ended up in jail in their small town. And basically what happened is that uh, it was like Bob and Hank, and they both had like ranches next to each other. And, you know, kind of like every day, hey Bob, hey Hank, you know, they're friends all these years. That culminated in Hank trying to choke Bob to death. And they both ended up choking each other, and somebody called the cops, they both were thrown in the little slammer of that town. It's like, oh my gosh, Bob and Hank, they've been neighbors for 40 years. And they end up in jail, trying to kill each other? What happened with Bob and Hank? How'd they end up with this relationship problem? Oh, let's find out. So what happened is, after all those years, uh, Bob used to burn his uh, leaves and things like that on the edge of his property. And uh, Hank um, saw him do that, and that was done a lot in the country. Except what happened is Hank had a different idea where the property line was. So the leaves weren't the only thing smoldering. So after 40 years of smoldering over, there goes Bob every week for 40 years burning his stuff on my property all the while, Bob's thinking, I'm, there's no issue here, I do what I do, and I, I, I don't have to think about it. And so after the smoldering of the leaves and the smoldering of Hank, Hank finally lost it and went over the line and tried to kill Bob. <laughs> now I would say they technically, what do you think about this? that they didn't have a relationship problem. What do you think about that statement? Huh? The point I'm making is they had a property line problem. They had a boundary problem, right? And they had lack of clarity exactly where one person ended and the other person began. What was good and perceived on one side of the line is being experienced as over the line by the other. So this is where we're starting in our idea of boundaries. 
when we look at those two pieces of property, now we're talking about relationships. Now we're talking about marriage. Now we're talking about communication styles. Now we're talking about time schedules. Now we're talking about all kinds of things. I'm like, I don't know why you're mad at me. Oh, I was a little late. Oh, I, le I left you at the airport for two hours. What's the big deal? You had airplanes to watch. I mean, like, however that could be perceived, and Hank comes flying over the line, choking you, right? So this idea of how do I understand my property line? How do I understand where I end and you begin? So let me pause there. Let me ask you guys, what do you think about that Bob and Hank, their primary problem wasn't a relationship problem. Their primary problem was a boundary problem. What are your comments on that? What's that make you think about, or does that start applying to relationships that you know about? What are your thoughts on that? Right, so then you'd say, then you start going, wow, did it have to wait 40 years? You'd say, did it have to get to like irreconcilable differences? Did it have to get violent? What could have been done sooner? So right there, we're really starting to talk about, wow, we're talking about boundary stuff automatically. I like that, right? So then we go, wow, then, then if there's lack of clarity on boundaries, oh, we might communicate something about where the line is. That's very good. What else comes to mind on Bob and Hank? Yep. Right, the so communication problem. And so keep in mind, so Hank was the one that did the choking, right? So in that case, uh, who needed to do what? He should have spoken up sooner. So right, so if Hank had a problem, he didn't speak up. Now, so keep that in mind, because some of us, we might be like, oh, I don't want to have any hostilities, I don't want to have any, you know, to create any um, conflict. I'm not a drama person, I just won't say anything. And so sometimes even that, and what's not said, we could say if we're kind of fitting this into our understanding of boundaries, we say, wow, okay, maybe the boundary issue it, in some cases is I don't let my needs be known. Or I don't speak up about what I feel is crossing a line. Okay, and we're going to get more into all the things that kind of get us all hung up on, on speaking up. Anything else that you want to say about Bob and Hank and that their primary problem was a relationship problem that was actually secondary, their primary problem was how they did their boundaries. Yes? They didn't agree on terms. Okay, so they didn't have clarity of, they didn't agree on terms, they didn't work something out to say, is this working for both of us? Okay. Isn't that a great example of marriage? Very often, that's the model. It is, is very often in marriage, one person is like, you know, what the heck? What are you talking about? And then, you know, Hank is the other spouse who's been smoldering for way too long. Okay, so very common dilemma there. I saw somewhere right here. Yeah? Uh, relation problem and communication is too general. You can't put your finger on the problem. So, in certain things, you're diagnosing yes. what you're going to work on. Yes. You say you're just communicating bad. What are we communicating? They're probably getting it fine. That's right, they talked every day. That's really good. So, Exactly. So then we'd say, um, when we start talking in boundary terms, we do get clearer on in what way is a boundary being crossed. Is, is it a boundary of time? Is it a boundary of how you feel that you're being talked to? Is it a boundary on uh, not paying attention to you? We can start putting our finger on what line, so when we feel offended, we do feel like some line got crossed. Right? Yeah. How does this relate to a monastery where you technically don't fool the right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't remember where you're kind of close, but in, in a sense, they don't have boundaries. They have their own self, but they're, they're in an open relationship with each other. So we'd still, so, so we could even take a question where we'd say a setting that's not known for a lot of um, attachments, therefore, there's not a lot of boundary lines per se. But we'd say, let's say that the, the boundary line of a monk would be they'd have a rule of prayer, probably more than we ever will, and then the boundaries would be, am I doing my prayers? The, the, the head abbot might be, hey, I need to talk to you. I'm noticing you're doing gardening when it's prayer time. <laughs> so even a boundary there could be 
a, a way of being centered? Am I leading a centered life? Uh, or am I just really nilly? So a monk, in a lot of ways, has very defined boundaries. Have you ever been woken up? Bong, bong, by, by bell, I fell in a monastery one time overnight. Uh, that bell rings a lot, I tell you. Um, and at the three in the morning or whatever, right? So, so we might look at boundaries differently, but keep in mind how they treat each other. During meals, they don't, they don't speak. But if someone starts going, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe what I saw in Seinfeld last night. <laughs> All the brothers would be like, um, hold on, that just crossed the boundary. So we might have different settings with different mores, but everywhere we are, there are lines that define when it's time to do something, when it's not time to do something. Even from the standpoint of how they treat each other, then comes into play on, whoa, you spoke harshly to me. Can we talk about that? Is even in the realm of, did someone cross a boundary how one brother treated another? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Compared to our boundaries, it seems like they don't. But then we'd say every system has boundaries that that brings health to that system. Yep, oh no. Anybody else? Okay. Um next slide. Okay. Definition number two. Boundaries define a sense of responsibility. What's mine to carry and what's not? So I don't know if you've ever been at a job where they're all excited to hire you, but they don't give you a job description. What would be one downside of not getting a job description? I don't know what your job is, what you're supposed to do. So then you wouldn't be clear on what's mine to do, what's not mine to do, what's mine to carry, what's not mine to carry. What else happens in that setting where there's no job description? It could be chaos. What else happens? So you don't know when to stop, right? So um, there was a it, it, there's a book called Boundaries by Cloud and Townsend. These two Christian psychologists written 20 years ago, kind of the famous boundaries book, a uh, good book. And um, and they tell of a case where these two parents came in for therapy to this to the one psychologist. They said, Doctor, our son needs therapy so bad. Okay, tell me about your son. <clears throat> He's 25 years old. He just quit his job at round table. He smokes weed every day. And he goes snowboarding every weekend. And um, the doctor says, so it sounds like you want him to do therapy because you think he has a problem? Oh, doctor, absolutely. He smokes weed every day. He quit his job. He does that one responsible thing and he just goes off and snowboards. And the doctor says, let me see if I've got it. You're, you're saying he smokes weed every day doesn't have a job and he goes snowboarding every week. And the doctor said, maybe I missed something, but it doesn't sound like he has a problem. And they're outraged, they're ready to leave the therapy room. And he, and, and he, he, he then says, no, hold on a second. Um, if he is able to smoke weed every day, not have a job, live <coughs> free in your house and snowboard every weekend, he's not the one with the problem. You are. Okay? That's boundaries number two. And that would be that mom and dad were very unclear on whose responsibility it was to carry what. Now, for those parents, were they were they carrying too much or too little? Okay, what are the kinds of
kinds of things they were carrying that goes in the category of too much. So they'd be rent free. Twenty-five years old. No responsibilities. Right. Okay, so money for the week, money for the snowboarding. Okay, and then uh, who didn't carry enough? The son, right? So this is where we get into this idea of boundaries number two that defines a sense of responsibility. We'd say very often it is not uncommon. I mentioned this in a prior talk briefly, I think the first week, but um, where it's not uncommon that there is a very um, common sort of relationship that, that happens between people where over-responsible people and under-responsible people find each other, okay? Now this is where we get a very therapy word, it's a good therapy word. Uh, if you've been to therapy, you know this word, so don't blurt it out, because then you'll out it when you've been to therapy a few times. No, only kidding. Um, <laughs> But so this is where the parents who are carrying way too much enable the son to not have to carry his load. So the therapy word is enabler. So what they've learned in therapy is the parents were enablers. They enabled him to not have to grow up. They enabled him to have a life as a young adult that didn't really require him to figure out how much he needed to be more responsible. They enabled him to be irresponsible. Or if we use kind of, I like the words, uh, over-responsible and under-responsible. And neither over or under are responsible. A lot of over-responsible people think they're super-duper responsible. They're just irresponsible in a super-duper way. Okay. So pause there. What do we think about this over-responsible, under-responsible, the therapy session on whose problem it was. What are your responses to that? What are your thoughts on that? What's that bring up for you? Even Why, if that's real to you, what, do you, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So what if the parents have expressed that they don't like those boundaries to also because they love them? Oh, good. They keep that up and then that's higher. Perfect. Because two people have different mm. kinds of boundaries, but one person doesn't want to respect them, but because there's not there, mm. Love the question. Can you tell us fake? I told her to ask that earlier. That's fantastic. It's too perfect of a question. So the question is, um, what if they told him, hey, you need to get with it and get a job, but he doesn't, but they love him? I love it. We're going to pause. We're going to have like a nice powerful pause on that one. What do you guys think about that? Yeah. So, so. And then you have to follow through. Okay, so let's talk about that. So we got the love thing going, which is awesome. And that doesn't mean that you don't love your child. It means you love your child more, making them be more responsible. So we, so let, let's. I like this. I like this. So we got, we got the love, we got the love thing, we got the boundary thing, uh, we got the. You can still have boundaries, and it doesn't mean it's not love. We have a hand going up here. Yes. <laughs> background, yep. religious life. So what happens if it's like, there's no compromise to lose, you are just accept that, but like, to allow that? Because I feel like with a son, yes, because I feel like you want to teach us, you want to be independent, but with a loved one, yes. I feel like our partner, that's very hard. Okay, it's hard in both cases. Yes. Okay, so now we're talking that boundary work is hard. Why is it hard? Because in what's kind of being talked about is, what if I'm with someone and they don't want to adhere to those boundaries? I might lose love. I might lose the person. And what I would say is the best way to stay stuck is don't set the boundary because you're afraid of what might happen. And our fear 
typically is a lot bigger usually than the fact that will will happen. It's possible, but usually it's the fear that keeps us in a boundaryless place. We're afraid of what might happen, and all the while, what we're doing is we're enabling them to be under responsible. So we have a very interesting situation, and I'm not going to make it sound simplistic, because boundary setting takes courage, and we discover we actually discover the true colors of people when we set boundaries with them, <clears throat> right? So we're not gonna we're gonna we're gonna put a pause on that point because there's so many things to touch on, and but I want us to think about absolutely the fear of loss, whether it be our son who's gonna he's gonna become a drug addict, he's gonna go marry the wrong woman. I, well, I'll just cut my losses. This is just good enough. And fear handcuffs us to not set the boundary. What if he leaves me, and I've got a little one, and he, he, I know he doesn't see it the same way, he'll probably take it wrong, so it, it'll probably be awful if I try to set the boundary. We just twist ourselves in a pretzel, and what we've lost is our basic sense, at least a basic roadmap of, I'm a person. You lose yourself, and you lose self-respect. One of the greatest ways to not be respected by others is to not respect yourself. And it's amazing, people who might even threaten to leave or whatever the thing is, and yet they encounter some kind of, okay, do this, and this is the deal, they go, okay, okay, boss. And it's like, wow, sometimes the most difficult people need to have very clear boundaries. And sometimes if we're like a little too manly pamby, a little too touchy-feely, we're almost saying, here's a boundary, maybe, and maybe you'll like it someday, and just do it for a second. If you don't like it, just discard it. Like we accidentally enable, this is where the word enable comes in. We enable them to not step up to be the person who learns how to respect boundaries. So I'm not saying, uh, you know, do that and call me in the morning as if I'm giving you an aspirin. This is the start of a discussion that's so valid in what you're bringing up and what you're bringing up and how the two have the same principles in it. Okay? Yes? Well, aren't the parents have the feeling that they're needed? So then, so we bring in love again. So we love our son. Right. He needs us, all true. But this is where boundaries definition number two is, but what's mine to care? It's a very practical question. I love my son, I love my husband, I love people, I love them, I love my priest, I love my parishioners, whatever it is. But the love word is not some kind of magic key that just breaks every boundary possibility because we'd say, my love for you is 100%. What I'm willing to carry is this much. If we equate our love with what we carry, We'll carry everything. Because our love is supposed to be sort of unlimited, but what we carry isn't supposed to be unlimited. Now, if people ended up healthy as a result, then I'd say carry it all. But people get sick carrying it all because the person who carries it all is gonna be a resentful mess, and the person not carrying it is gonna be an immature half adult. And in 40 years, you can go choke that person. Right, and so then, yeah, and then enter in hang. Hey, where are you? Ooh. Okay, so this is so good that we're talking about need and love and, and there for people, all the right stuff. That is not the same as, as if we go blurry eyed and like, what do I carry and what, what don't I? Thanks, boss, for the job. No job description. Oh, overtime again? I'm not done yet. I didn't know when I'm done if I have no job description. So this is really about being in relationships with a job description. If I could put it that way. Yeah. It just seems like this is a really long standing problem, but they have anything to present probably together. Well, so this is an important point. So you bring up the whole point around Bob and Hank, and that is how much has been, been communicated? What is compromised communication? Or we can say this, and I think I've got, uh, let me just see if I have a snow on it yet. Um, I'm not sure if I have the graphic, but if you've ever seen a no trespassing sign, the big letters say what? No trespassing. What's the small letters say? Trespassers will be shot. Yeah. 
trespassers or violators will be prosecuted. Okay? We're good on the big letters. You really need to get a job. You really shouldn't smoke weed in the living room. We don't do the small letters. That's where action matches up with the words. That there's outcomes to these actions that we communicate. And if this continues, we'll have to do this differently. Okay? So our, our own, um, what do you want to call it, patterns around our use of words without action is sometimes the dilemma of the boundary journey. So we might even, it's good if we verbalize boundaries, but if we don't have actions to follow, then people learn, like the kids learn this in a second. <clears throat> You're not going to go out Friday night unless you clean your room first. They don't clean their room, they go out on Friday night. Right yes. words, no actions. You say that like a period, that's like no emotion. Right. And then some people think, we'll get into this in other talks, other weeks, but sometimes we think, I don't have a boundary until when? Until I'm pissed off enough. And then people don't hear your boundary, they just go, you're a freak. <laughs> Dude, what's up with you? You have a problem? And say, now it's about our anger rather than about the very boundary we're trying to communicate. The thing is, this is so hard to do, and I can't see anybody being able to do it by themselves. You know, you're trying to do it by yourself. I had to have a lot of support. Right, so then, then we say, so here, you know, here comes the community. If we start saying, better boundaries. When we start talking with other people who can relate to that, like, oh my gosh, I was boundaryless until the kids were this age, and then I did this, or, you know, or my, my marriage worked this way, that I had to set a boundary. Like, we need each other in community. This really brings up the vision of Family Night and of Family Wellness at St. Basil. Because it's good to get information, but we take information and we connect with the community to say, how are you doing? This is what's going on for me. Can you pray for me? This, and then we can have a boundaries class that have breakout groups throughout a year that you offer to the whole community. Because we all, we talk about evangelism, this is how we reach people because we, we know we're all struggling. Let's be there for each other. So what we do in community is the support system and how safe it is to have a community where we really open up like you guys are. There's something beautiful that happens. It's hard to talk about, but it's beautiful that you guys open up about that. Okay, so that community is a big deal. Okay, let's go. Okay, so um, let me say it this way. If we then say this kind, of, you know, this kind of dilemma we're talking about, we can say that's where we end up with some boundary issues. And so I would say a couple things, and this is a little the deal that comes from that boundaries book. First of all, this, this kind of play on words, responsible to and responsible for. This is going to help us out in, but my kid needs me, but I want to show love. This is where this helps a little bit, this kind of play on words. The idea is this. Healthy relationships occur when there's the realization, and this is super fuzzy in most relationships, but healthy relationships occur when the individuals in that relationship know that they are responsible for themselves. Which means not only are they responsible, in the case of the 25-year-old, to go get a job, someone can't get a job for him, to deal with addiction, somebody can't do that for him, he has to be responsible for himself. But also we'd say being responsible for yourself is not only duties and tasks that we could say fits in your backpack. To be responsible for ourselves is that you have a backpack and no one else is supposed to carry your backpack. And how you carry your backpack will define how responsible you are. But the interesting thing is, the other thing that's in our backpack is our emotional life. And there is no such thing if we carry our backpack, there's no such thing as you made me mad. That's baloney. Now, what we might be saying is we're, we're sharing the explosion that happened in our, in our solar plexus where the other person did something that triggered us. And because of who we are, we got mad. So who's responsible for me being mad? I'm responsible for me being mad. Because 
If I'm not responsible for be me being mad, then we end up on a police report on domestic violence. Because literally, you can look them up online. The, what's written on the interview of the offending violent husband is, she made me hit her. I warned her not to say anything. She said one more thing, and so I hit her. I don't know why you're arresting me. It's her fault. That's a perfect example of, I'm not responsible for this emotional whatever happens here. Someone else is. So that's resp I'm responsible for my mood. I'm responsible for my reaction. I'm responsible for my attitude. I'm responsible for my... What's nice is, I'm meant to carry that. I have the right to have my feelings. I have the right to have my... So we have two R words there. I have the right to have my feelings, and I have responsibility on what I do with my feelings. I have the right to do my opinions, but I have responsibility on how I communicate those opinions. I have the right to have my preferences. It's my responsibility on how that affects other people. That's, how, what, that's what I'm responsible for. It's how I carry my backpack. Responsible to is I'm responsible to, if we use our little backpack boulder analogy, I'm responsible to help you when you're trying to push that boulder uphill. I'm responsible to be helpful when something is happening that is beyond your backpack and, and this inordinate huge load. Man, I want to help if I can. So in the book of Galatians, it, in chapter 6, it says, carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So that kind of matches up with they need me, I need to love them. Carry each other's burdens and so forth us love Christ. At the end of that verse, interestingly, it says, but each should carry his own load. So if we break it down in the Greek, it's similar to saying, carry each other's boulders and so fulfill the law of Christ, but each should carry his own backpack. That's the life where we get some clarity on this boundary confusion on what's mine to carry, what's not. And if I keep carrying other people's backpacks and mistakenly think everything's a boulder because they act like everything's a boulder, we can have the discernment to say, well, actually, they can call Uber and I don't have to do it for them or whatever, something that we automatically do. What do you think about two and four? Is that helpful? So very often, the boundary problems we have in our marriages and our relationships is we just have those words mixed up, and at least one of us, sometimes both of us, whatever, has it mixed up, and we feel responsible for the other person's mood, happiness, everything, everything and everything. So what do we do if, we're, if we feel responsible for someone else's mood? What does that do to our emotional life? Stressful. What else? Hmm? Okay, we can get really upset and burnt out. And, yeah. Yes, yeah, sense of failure. It's not working yet. They're still getting in a bad mood. What did I do wrong? Yeah. It also leads us to being controlling because if we feel like it's our responsibility mm. to help them fix their problem. Great point. So listen to that one. So we can kind of see the over-responsible person that's like, you know, mission to mercy. I'm getting burnt out, but I'm going to do it. But then the underbelly of that mission to mercy is, I kind of like being responsible for everybody. I actually, and I can feel a lot of control around that. So where does control play into this equation of what I'm carrying and what I'm not? So, right, so, so we, we, that load is, is, is pretty, um, uh, you know, inflated and, and, and problematic. Uh, and somewhere in carrying that load, we have some kind of boundary mix up of what's our job or what we're supposed to control to bring health and growth. It's why they use the term Tough love. I had a bank account in 1981 with Bank of America. I just finished up college, and Bank of America offered me something that I'll never forgive them for. It was called overdraft protection. What happened with my young life with overdraft protection? Who cares about what the balance is? I'm good. I feel the love from B of A. They keep giving me more money. 
and I didn't pay attention on how to be responsible in writing checks. And then they offered the, and then that uh, overdraft would just go on this credit card. And so there was this mythical thing that it's all gonna work out. It didn't work out. Because there was no boundary sense that if I have 50 bucks in my account and I wanna write a $55 check, it's not a good idea. So see how that, so sometimes this, Boundary confusion is giving all our relationships overdraft protection. And that's not the same as grace from God. And I want us to have discernment. Sometimes we have that grace and go, okay, people aren't perfect, I'll pick the kids up, don't worry about it. And there's, there's, we're not talking about rigid, tough, not my job. So keep in mind, if we go too far on the love misunderstanding, then we think the opposite and we go too far with the thinking understanding. Like, then I'm going to be a Nazi boundary person, like a bagel Nazi or soup Nazi on Seinfeld. It would be, and there are plenty of people who just start getting in touch with their boundaries, they become boundary Nazis. And at first, they're like, no, not my job. And you're like, whoa, chick, back off. You know, like, and we get all, you know, because they're still in that stage. So we have to kind of work it out, get exercised in it. But let's not think of these, these pendulum swings back and forth. Let's think about if we do overdraft, the person never learns how to balance a checkbook. And that's an issue of responsibility for speaking, sort of emotionally speaking, right? Okay. So, when we think about the families we grew up in, and you sort of picture them, I'm not sure what year you're picturing, I'm picturing 1971, because all my siblings lived in the house still. Picture your family that you grew up in. That is your emotional classroom. What I'd like you to consider and discuss a bit for these minutes, and I'll interrupt you in a few minutes, I'd like you to discuss a little bit what boundary lessons did I learn in the emotional classroom that I grew up in? What did I see about boundaries? Who had power? Who said, said, said yes? Who said no? Where are their boundaries? How'd they work? Were they communicating? <coughs> So as we think about our emotional classrooms, at your tables, I want you to think and then share what boundary lessons did I learn for myself from my emotional classroom. Ready, set, go. I 
kind of relate to like, okay, well, why weren't you like doing this with the kids? Like my dad did. Like I'm right. being what I expect on my right. dad. My dad. Right. So, so I didn't have. Like, how will I know? So it really brings up a great point. Not only looking at what better lessons I learned in my emotional classroom growing up, but I married a different classroom. <laughs> and their lessons are different than my lessons. Their classroom looks different than my classroom. And my expectations that I have are from my classroom that may not make sense to the person from the other classroom. And you illustrated that perfectly. So here we see that, wow, this boundary thing, we can see why it starts becoming a thing. Everything from expectations to something that was really there, you know, made me think a certain way, another person that wasn't there, and somebody thinks differently, and they don't know what they don't know, and that kind of thing. Interesting. Yeah? And you don't know how close those boundaries are until you step out. Right, and so interesting. So and, so those boundaries, that, and then when you step out, then you find out a lot. Say, I married from Right, so then you so so we can even say culturally is a different classroom. Yeah. And when you marry in your culture, it still could be a different classroom, but a, a more familiar culture, at least the food's the same. And um, <laughs> and then when you marry and then there's something like you want to get away from from your original classroom, so you marry outside the culture, you go, phew, uh oh, and then you encounter the various things that happen in that very different cultural classroom. All of which are boundary issues. All of which are Bob and Hank. All of which, where do I draw a line? All of which has to do with what's mine to carry and what's not. So I want us to be thinking about, the, so if we just start feeling overwhelmed by this, um, I ask that you just return to the two things we learned and that when you get all frazzled, where do I end and the other person begins? And what's mine to carry and what's not? That, that gives us a sense of sanity and something to organize around so we have some sense of maybe what we might want to consider saying or doing. Okay? So this is good. Um, well, we can go to town on the different classroom thing um, and, and even give it thoughts. So maybe we'll start next week just to hear about more classrooms. And when we think about that, again, that, that was our curriculum. Um, and that's where we learned it. And so, and as they say, if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. Um, and as I've quoted in here before, depending on what kind of tools were in the toolbox, uh, from your family, uh, I've said I've said that age-old quote: uh, "If all you have, have is a hammer, uh, everything starts looking like a nail." And so that even has boundary implications on how we handle situations. Okay, good work, you guys. Keep the prayers going because to begin to look at boundaries, you begin to look at your heart. It's the last place the devil wants you to be. So some of us might even go home and go, wow, I feel depressed. Or some might be, I feel afraid. Or some might be, oh, this is super exciting. It may vary across the board. But guard your hearts in prayer because the Lord wants us to be illuminated. Back to the house blessing. We're going to have the house blessed. We're going to look at our whole life to see how light can shine in all parts of our experience so we don't walk in darkness. Okay, with that said, thank you for your business. Thank you. All right, so to give us a little sneak peek on next week, we know we're, we're heading into the, the second part of four of this uh, talk on boundaries and insights into our family dynamics. And what we saw tonight, just that basic idea of boundaries and where do I draw the line and what's mine to carry, what's not. We talked, we ended up with this whole idea of whatever happened in my emotional classroom, which is a family I grew up in, really gave me the kind of ABCs of how to understand boundaries. So next week, we're going to launch right into the, our family situation. We're going to talk about this whole thing called uh, family systems, which is to understand how does the family function, whatever's going on in a part of the family, how it affects everyone. Definitely what we're going to look at is very often there's bumps in family life. Sometimes we put our heart on hold 
development of self on hold and we take on a role to smooth out that bumping family. Very often it's that role we take into our adult relationships thinking it's the real us but we're just carrying on a role. And depending on that role, that role might be a role that controls everything, it might be a role that concedes everything, it could be a role that has no boundaries, it could be a role that feels responsible for everything. So really getting discernment on what's going on with what role do I take on versus what person lives in here and how do I get access to my own beating heart. So we're going to get some clarity on what happens in our family system and how we can really emerge, even after years, emerge into a life that really comes from the heart, comes from the center, and we have a sense of having core strength to be able to make sense of how we interact in all relationships.